to the 2011 Bradley Symposium, devoted to the question of true Americanism, what it is and why it matters. National Affairs is very pleased once again to be co-hosting the symposium this year together with the Hudson Institute's Bradley Center for Philanthropy and Civic Renewal. A few very quick words of thanks before we get started. Uh, first of all, to Bill Chambra and Kristen McIntyre at Hudson, who has, al has always have done the real work of making this happen, to Cheryl Miller at AI, and above all, to the Lyndon Harry Bradley Foundation, which supports so many important projects aimed at advancing American ideals and our understanding of American life. We're very honored this morning to have with us so many of the Foundation's board members and their families, as well as the Foundation's staff members. Many thanks to all of you, and we're particularly grateful to Dan Schmidt of Bradley for his guidance and wisdom in helping to set up this event. Our subject today flows naturally from the Bradley Foundation's longstanding interest in civic education and American identity, one product of which was E Pluribus Unum, the Bradley Project on America's National Identity, which produced a report in 2008 that I would highly recommend to anyone interested in our subject this morning. But beyond that general interest, the occasion for taking up the question the way we will today is the publication of an important and quite wonderful new collection of readings entitled, What So Proudly We Hail, The American Soul in Story, Speech, and Song, edited by Amy Cass, Leon Cass, and Diana Schaub, all of whom are with us this morning. And I see that a lot of you have copies of the book with you. The book is a collection of short stories and speeches and reflections that all, in one way or another, get at the question of American identity, of who we are and what we are about as a nation. It's about America's character and creed, about the place of the law, of courage and sacrifice, of civ civility and Republican virtues in our civic life, and about the enormously difficult challenges of assimilation and integration in American life, of building and sustaining our impossibly complex society. And it's a collection that, as the subtitle suggests, speaks not just to the mind, but to the heart and soul. One of the things that it captures especially well is the way in which American patriotism has always simultaneously addressed itself to the hearts and to the minds of American citizens. How our creed has always been part philosophy and part poetry. That has always made American civic education especially complicated and challenging. And the aim of our symposium today is to take up a portion of that challenge. As the form of this book suggests, the best way to do that is through a conversation grounded in a particularly rich and engaging text and ideally also helped along by wise teachers. We're fortunate to have with us this morning a panel of people perfectly suited for just such a conversation. The people on the stage here hardly need much of an introduction, so all I really need to do is tell you who they are and let them get started. With us, as you see, are Lamar Alexander, Senator from Tennessee and Chairman of the Senate Republican Conference, Robert George, the McCormick Professor of Jurisprudence at Princeton University, <coughs> Frank Hanna, the CEO of Hanna Capital, Daniel Henninger, Deputy Editorial Page Editor of the Wall Street Journal. Charles Krauthammer, the great Pulitzer Prize winning columnist. Harvey Mansfield, Professor of Government at Harvard University. And I should add also a winner of, one of the winners of the 2011 Bradley Prizes, which will be given out tonight. Wilford McClay, Professor of History at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga and a Senior Fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center. Paul Singer, the founder of Elliott Associates. Juan Williams, a journalist and Fox News political analyst. Diana Schaub, Professor of Political Science at Loyola College in Maryland and co-editor of this new volume. Our conversation will be guided by Diana's two other co-editors and two of America's greatest teachers for decades at the University of Chicago and now with us here in Washington, Amy Cass, who is now at the Hudson Institute, and Leon Cass at the American Enterprise Institute. Amy will get us started this morning, so with no further ado, Amy Cass. Thank you, Yuval. Can everybody hear me? At one point in his essay, True Americanism, soon to be discussed, Theodore Roosevelt asserts that Americans who choose to live in Europe never really become Europeans. They only cease being American and become, he says, nothing. Over a century later, in a class at the University of Chicago, I saw Roosevelt's assertion turned upside down. Just a few weeks after 9-11, on the first day of my course on human being and citizen, I began by asking the 28 eager freshmen to identify themselves by name and to say a few words about who they were. The following ensued. Student one, I'm A and I'm Korean American. 
I'm B student two, I'm B and I'm Hispanic American, student three, I'm C and I'm Catholic American. And so it went until one student said, I'm Q and I'm, well, well, I'm just American, which I guess means I'm nothing. His classmates silently but sympathetically concurred. <laughs> Familiar with the posturing of undergraduates, I would usually have dismissed the student's speech as well as the class reaction. But this was just <clears throat> after 9-11, when 3,000 of their fellow citizens had been killed merely for being just Americans. In what country, I wondered, did these people, United States citizens all, think they were living? Ten years later, what it means to be an American remains troublingly unsettled. We increasingly celebrate diversity and multiculturalism at home and globalization and internationalism abroad. Many of our most privileged young people regard themselves mainly as citizens of the world. Among intellectuals, the very idea of national identity is under challenge. Spontaneous displays of patriotism often provoke moral critiques from opinion leaders. Regarding immigration, we no longer hear of the melting pot. It has been years since serious public figures spoke about the American way of life. <coughs> What then do we Americans have in common and what unites us as Americans? How do we Americans identify ourselves as individuals and as a people? What do we look up to and revere? To what larger community and ideals are we attached and devoted? For what are we willing to fight and to sacrifice? Making its public debut today, our new anthology entitled What So Proudly We Hail speaks directly to these questions. Informed by the conviction that making citizens is as much a matter of the heart as it is of the mind, it seeks to exploit the soul-shaping possibilities of American short stories, political speeches, and songs to promote self-reflection and thoughtful patriotism. The selections are grouped in six chapters, each addressing a crucial issue. National identity and why it matters. The American creed, liberty, equality, individual enterprise, religious freedom, and toleration. The American character, displaying the strengths and weaknesses of individuals who are informed by the American creed. The virtues of a robust citizenry among them self-command, law-abidingness, courage, civility, compassion, public-spiritedness, and reverence. The sometimes competing goals of civic life, lifting the floor, elevating the ceiling, and preserving and perpetuating what we hold dear. And finally, how to make a national one out of a multicultural many. <clears throat> Theodore Roosevelt's speech on true Americanism, which appears in our final chapter in the section on immigration and assimilation, makes it clear that creating an American unum out of our variegated pluribus is hardly a new difficulty. Written in 1894, when both the legacy of the Civil War and the great waves of European immigration provoke concerns about national unity and national identity, Roosevelt insists on the necessity of undivided civic loyalty and national attachment to the American Republic. Our panel this morning will use Theodore Roosevelt's essay as the point of departure for considering the meaning and significance of Americanism today. They have all read the essay Many of you probably have not to make it possible for everyone here and those watching on C-SPAN to follow the conversation and to help prime the panel's pump, we will give Theodore Roosevelt the first words as Leon will read some excerpts from his essay. I won't try to impersonate uh, <laughs> Bully Pulpit, but um, I'll try to read it with some gusto. 
These are just excerpts, uh, longish excerpts, but to get it all out before us. We Americans have many grave problems to solve, many threatening evils to fight, and many deeds to do, if, as we hope and believe, we have the wisdom, the strength, the courage, and the virtue to do them. Yet there is one quality which we must bring to the solution of every problem. That is an intense and fervent Americanism. We shall never be successful over the dangers that confront us. We shall never achieve true greatness, nor reach the lofty ideal which the founders and preservers of our mighty federal republic have set before us. Unless we are Americans in heart and soul, in spirit and purpose, keenly alive to the responsibility implied in the very name of American, and proud beyond measure of the glorious privilege of bearing it. There are two or three sides to the question of Americanism and two or three senses in which the word Americanism can be used to express the antithesis of what is unwholesome and undesirable. In the first place, we wish to be broadly American and national, as opposed to being local or sectional. We do not wish in politics, in literature, or in art to develop that unwholesome parochial spirit, that over-exaltation of the little community at the expense of the great nation, which produces what has been described as the patriotism of the village, the patriotism of the belfry. Second, the patriotism of the village or the belfry is bad, but the lack of all patriotism is even worse. It may be that an age is so remote that we cannot now understand any of the feelings of those who will dwell in them. Patriotism will no longer be regarded as a virtue, exactly as it may be that in those remote ages, people will look down upon and disregard monogamic marriage. But as things now are and have been for two or 3,000 years past, and are likely to be for two or 3,000 years to come, the words home and country mean a great deal. At present, treason, like adultery, ranks as one of the worst of all possible crimes. One may very, fall very far short of treason and yet be an undesirable citizen in the community. The man who becomes Europeanized and who loses his love for his native land is not a traitor, but he is a silly and undesirable citizen. Nothing will more quickly or more surely disqualify a man from doing good work in the world than the acquirement of that flaccid habit of mind which its possessors style cosmopolitanism. It is not only necessary to Americanize the immigrants of foreign birth who settle among us, but it is even more necessary for those among us who are by birth and descent already Americans not to throw away our birthright and with incredible and contemptible folly, wander back to bow down before the alien gods whom our forefathers forsook. The third sense in which the word Americanism may be employed is with reference to the Americanizing of the newcomers to our shores. We must Americanize them in every way, in speech, in political ideas and principles, and in their way of looking at the relations between church and state. We welcome the German or the Irishman who becomes an American. We have no use for the German or Irishman who remains such. We do not wish German Americans or Irish Americans who figure as such in our political, social and political life. We want only Americans, and provided they are such, we do not care whether they are of native or of Irish or of German ancestry. We have no room in any healthy American community for a German-American vote or an Irish-American vote, and it is contemptible demagogy to put planks into any party platform with the purpose of catching such a vote. We have no room for any people who do not act and vote simply as Americans and as nothing else. Moreover, we have as little use for people who carry religious prejudices into our politics as for those who carry prejudices of caste or nationality. We stand unalterably in favor of the public school system in its entirety. We believe that English and no other language is that in which all the school exercises should be conducted. We are against any division of the school fund and against any appropriation of public money for sectarian purposes. But we are equally opposed to any discrimination against or for a man because of his creed. We demand that all citizens, Protestant and Catholic, Jew and Gentile, shall have fair treatment in every way, 
and that all alike shall have their rights guaranteed them. More than a third of the people of the northern states are of foreign birth and parentage. An immense number of them have become completely Americanized, and these stand on exactly the same plane as the descendants of any Puritan, Cavalier, or Knickerbocker among us, and do their full and honorable share of the nation's work. But where immigrants or the sons of immigrants do not heartily and in good faith throw in their lot with us, but cling to the speech, the customs, the ways of life, and the habits of thought of the old world which they have left, they thereby harm both themselves and us. It is an immense benefit to the European immigrant to change him into an American citizen. To bear the name of American is to bear the most honorable titles. And whoever does not so believe has no business to bear the name at all. And if he comes from Europe, the sooner he goes back, the better. <laughs> we freely extend the hand of welcome and of good fellowship to every man, no matter what his creed or birthplace, who comes here honestly intent on becoming a good United States citizen like the rest of us. But we have a right, and it is our duty, to demand that he shall indeed become so. Americanism is a question of spirit, conviction, and purpose, not of creed or birthplace. A Scandinavian, a German, or an Irishman who has really become an American has the right to stand on exactly the same footing as any native-born citizen in the land and is just as much entitled to the friendship and support, social and political, of his neighbors. We Americans can only do our allotted task well if we face it steadily and bravely, seeing but not fearing the dangers. Above all, we must stand shoulder to shoulder, not asking as to the ancestry or creed of our comrades, but only demanding that they be in very truth Americans, and that we all work together, heart, hand, and head, for the honor and greatness of our common country. <laughs> The panel has been asked to discuss three topics, which we will consider uh, in turn. First, Roosevelt's view of the nature of true, true Americanism. Second, and more important, our own views of the meaning of Americanism today. And third, why it matters. We're going to proceed not by prepared speeches, but it is to be hoped by a genuine conversation which Leon and I will try to keep on track and keep moving forward. So we begin with Roosevelt. As you have heard, Theodore Roosevelt approaches true Americanism negatively in terms of three antitheses. It is opposed to narrow local and parochial institutions or attachments. It is opposed to overbroad global attachments, cosmopolitanism. It is opposed both for immigrants and for our electoral politics to ethnically or religiously hyphenated identities. In a word, we should all regard ourselves and one another simply and unqualifiedly as Americans. But what is the positive content of American identity and attachment. What exactly, according to Roosevelt, does true Americanism consist of? What are, to use his terms, its common spirit, convictions, and purposes? So who would like to begin? If you're shy, I'll just call on you. <laughs> <laughs> Robbie. Uh, Amy, if... Uh Americanism is a question of spirit, conviction, and purpose, as Roosevelt says, and I certainly agree with that. Uh, then the question is, what's the conviction? From the conviction, we should get a sense of the spirit and the, and the purpose. Uh, and the conviction, I think, we draw from the Declaration of Independence. It captures it so perfectly. Interestingly, it doesn't appear in the, at least in the parts of the speech that we were, that we were given. And I'm referring, of course, to the, to the great second sentence of the Declaration, that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. What Lincoln called the, the American proposition, and which he uh, repaired to time and time and time again in, in, in defending uh, the nation in the context of the, uh, 
of the Civil War. Uh, I'll, I'll venture a thought, Leon. Uh, if, if we can use that old uh, principle of Aristotle's method of invite in social science of, of identifying the focal case of a thing and then identifying less, uh, less focal cases by reference to the, to the central or, or focal case. It would seem to me that the focal case of an American is uh, a person who identifies himself as an American where his sense of identity is rooted in precisely that conviction, the belief that it's just true, it's basic that all men are created equal and that they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that these are rights that did not come from the government, they did not come from kings or presidents or parliaments or legislatures from no human power and therefore cannot be taken away by any merely human power. Rather, it's the duty of all human political authority to protect those rights and to honor them themselves. How about it? Diana? Why do you think there is no mention in this speech of the, uh, of the American principles? Uh, what I get from the speech is that an Americanism is mostly a matter of energy and courage and struggle and material prosperity. Uh, I guess it strikes me as a Roosevelt's presentation as a pretty inadequate or truncated version of Americanism. Uh, what he admires are the empire builders, you know, whether in the realm of, of politics or commerce. Uh, everything that he mentions is put in the context of conquest. Um, so I mean, on the basis of, of what Roosevelt presents, I, I don't see how the greatness of the American Republic would differ from the greatness of the Roman Republic, uh, except for the fact that we speak English and insist on speaking English. I mean, I would agree with you about my definition of Americanism, but I don't really get that from the, from the Roosevelt speech. Senator. Uh, I think perhaps he just assumed in 1894 that everybody knew what it meant to be an American that uh, you had a common culture that came from a, 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 you know, people used to say in Tennessee, uh, I remember an old farmer said, I've got, if I read the, the Bible and the Farmer's Almanac and the Commercial Appeal, that's about all I need. And, and uh, uh, people, people knew the same things. The, the, uh, he didn't define it, said what he was against, but it seems to me if we were looking for a definition, it's simply that we, we, we pledge allegiance to a creed of beliefs that unite us as a country, that's our greatest accomplishment. Uh, I mean, you can't be, you can't become Chinese, you have to become American if you want to be a citizen. I suspect he, he just figured we knew that there were a few common, common principles, not just equal opportunity, but liberty, rule of law, a few others. And then there's some that you might put under character, like anything is possible, that we all knew that, and then what we should do is be that and uh, instead of uh, what we used to be. Uh, and, and then throw in the common language. During his presidency, you know, it, it became necessary for people to, uh, every new citizen to learn English. That was in 1906. And also going on in 1894, uh, Robert Putnam has written a lot about all the Americanizing efforts that were going on. I mean, the Kohler uh, company in Wisconsin would bring in a lot of Germans and they'd, they'd spend a lot of time teaching them what it meant to be an American and the Kiwanis clubs and the Boy Scouts and the Civic Clubs and all these organizations would do that. And I suspect they just all thought they knew what it meant. So why the heavy duty emphasis on hardihood and courage and the things that Diana was referring to? That was just Roosevelt. <laughs> 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 no, I would, I would say uh, that was his manliness. I'm an expert on man. <laughs> <laughs> Literally written uh, yeah. the book, and uh, he likes to set himself off against others. He likes to make himself dramatic. He likes to think that he's uh, finds himself in a horrible situation, and there's no solution from that, except uh, ex for that, except uh, to assert yourself. And so he does that, and he likes to make uh, great uh, distinctions and divisions among us. And um, I guess he reminds us, I would say that uh, if it's true that patriotism is a matter of heart as well as mind, as Yuval Levin said, um, the heart is also uh, the seat of not just love, but also anger. And maybe anger is closer to politics than love is. Frank. I, I am con oh, sorry. Um, no, it's all right. I'm, I'm wearing a lavalier mic. 
Um, I think the way, the way to look at it, uh, to make it um, sort of sharp, would be to say that Roosevelt's idea of Americanism has to do with energy or manhood. <coughs> and I would say that our idea has to do with liberty. After all, manliness and energy are not anything unique to the United States. As Diane was saying, all the Republican virtues, courage, rule of law, etc., we have in common with Rome. What makes us different from all the other republics, from, say, all the other nations in the West? We're the only one, and this is unique in human history, founded on a proposition founded on a document. Our day of independence is the day on which it was signed. The French is a storming of the, the Bastille, heralding some kind of victory, either in revolution or battle. Uh, and this dedication to an idea, to a principle, is from which, th it is that from which everything else uh, President Roosevelt was talking about. Because we are dedicated to liberty, because we're dedicated to uh, the rule of law within a specific, almost sacred document. Uh, our presidents swear to defend the Constitution, not the people, not the Volk, not the state, not the government, uh, not the land, the Constitution. That's a very unusual idea. And that's what unites us. And it is, it revolves around liberty to an extent that I think almost no other country does. I mean, if you walk around Washington, you will see, which I think is unique in capital cities in the world, there are statues in the city all over dedicated to liberators of other countries. On Constitution Avenue, you have statues to Bolivar and all the Latin Americans. There's a huge Ukrainian monument within a mile of here. On, on Massachusetts Avenue, you've got the Gandhi and uh, Thomas Masaryk, 100 yards apart, looking at each other. In no other city would we be celebrating the idea of liberty as expressed through other countries in the capital. That's what makes us different. I would say that our idea um, of liberty is what distinguishes us. And because it's about dedication to a proposition, that's um, what brings us to uh, the idea that we do not want to see this kind of ethnic separatism that was in that speech and that we see proliferating today uh, because it negates the entire idea of people being American as a result of this allegiance to a constitution and to a principle rather than allegiance to clan or tribe or race or ethnicity. Yeah, I, I, I was concerned uh, that maybe the line that troubled me most was when he said patriotism of the village is bad. Um, and I thought to myself, well, the core of the village is a family. And so the, I, I felt he was bifurcating my allegiances. I have, as a human being, we, I, all of us have competing claims on us. Uh, my, my agreement to the proposition, as Charles was speaking about, and I actually prefer to look at the preamble to the Constitution as opposed necessarily to the Declaration of Independence, because I think it's sort of the Constitution that we as Americans sign on to in a manner of covenant with one another. And so certainly my covenant with all of the Americans in this room uh, is something to which I should have a lot of allegiance and loyalty. But it is not preeminent. It is not preeminent to the covenant I made with my wife, to the covenant I have with my children, uh, to, the, to the faith I have. And so uh, I got the feeling Roosevelt was trying to shove us into saying that our covenant as Americans is superior to all else. Um, and uh, and I, 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 I don't know that that's healthy for us or is natural for us as human beings. Well, would you want to say that your covenant with your family makes you American? No, not, not per se. I think there are wonderful families in every country and families have loyalty to one another. Uh, I think the, the liberty that Americans uh, uh, strive to provide for one another in our, you know, to, to, to provide the domestic tranquility and ensure the common defense, all those things that are in the 
preamble, and notably the blessings of liberty, I think that helps my family. I think it can help make my family healthier. But the covenant with, with my wife is not an American thing, or with my family. Bill. I, I just want to elaborate on that a little bit. I, I, I was uncomfortable from the beginning with the notion of Americanism, which sounds like an ideology, and uh, it seems to me to lead us in the wrong direction. I mean, Americanism is not like Marxism or positivism or something like that. But I, I agree that uh, I was troubled by the <clears throat> it, but it's perfectly consistent with everything else we know about Roosevelt, this, his overly nationalistic view of national identity and his belief that local affiliations are, uh, are, are dangerous. Now, part of that is the context of the, the post-Civil War era in which uh, uh, those kind of, of local affinities are, are very much on his mind. That's why he mentions Mark Twain and Joel Chandler Harris as the two authors who are, and, uh, and certainly Harris is a regional author, <laughs> if anybody ever was one, uh, this is the Uncle Remus uh, author, but, uh, but he's at pains to sort of include the South. Uh, he doesn't, in 1894, two years before Plessy versus Ferguson, include uh, African Americans, and I think that's a, a notable admission that has to be uh, counted. But on the question of other family and local affiliations in some way detracting from the nation. I think he misunderstands the nature of American national feeling that in fact it has been through our federal system and various other means, it has been the genius of American national sentiment to allow local affiliations to lead into larger ones. Tocqueville observed this very thing that if you let, let a man have a control over his property and his locality and have a voice in local governance, then it will <coughs> stir his sentiments of patriotism for the nation as a whole. So I think uh, setting these two in opposition is, uh, is quite wrong-headed, although it's very consistent with Roosevelt if you look at his new nationalism speech uh, uh, in 1910. It's very much uh, privileging the nation over all other things and seeing the states and localities as mere administrative units. Well, I disagree with, uh, to some degree, with Wilfred and uh, Frank on this uh, topic. I think Roosevelt um, calibrated, uh, took the zoom lens and twisted it um, just about right when he rejected both the um, multiculturalism and the world view that were citizens of the world. He didn't use that phrase, I think. Um, uh, and also rejected the, the uh, primacy of the tribe the um, sectarian group. Um, and what I think he did when he uh, made that calibration uh, was create something very robust, because tribalism uh, is not just a, a, a dysfunctional tribalism harming the, um, uh, the uh, uh, creation and maintenance of critical mass to, uh, to provide economic security, military security, um, um, uh, and uh, uh, keep the, uh, the whole uh, growing, uh, peaceful, and uh, prosperous. Um, uh, it, he got it just about right. Um, to this day, uh, tribalism and sectarianism and um, allegiances to um, uh, groups um, um, smaller than America are um, uh, going the wrong direction, going the opposite direction. So I think he, he created a very robust calibration of primary allegiance without taking away, of course, uh, to the um, allegiance to the to the family and to uh, to the spouse and um, um, mean, the close knit uh, group. I don't I don't entirely disagree with you about that, but let let me give an example that may help flesh out what I mean a little better. Consider Thanksgiving, which is a holiday that actually many uh, in other countries simply do not understand. Uh, for Americans, it's probably our most uncontroversial ho uh, holiday. Uh, and it, Thanksgiving is a holiday. It's a remarkable thing when you think about it because it brings together uh, families. I mean, families generally come together for Thanksgiving. But there is a sense that this is a national right, that we all, something we all perform together, even if we don't believe in something to give thanks to. We sort of overlook that for the moment and, and have a sort of attitude of, of uh, generic gratefulness for the things that we have. But my point is that this is, this is something that uh, the entranceway is through the life of the family, but it, 
it radiates out and ramifies out into loyalties and affinities and loves that are much larger in scope. And it's very interesting to, uh, to mention Thanksgiving. I'd like to throw out um, a, a different observation about a different holiday and um, how it, uh, Im, uh, it, it reflects some of the distinctions that, uh, that uh, Roosevelt uh, uh, made. He didn't just have a cold analytical view of Europe in opposition to America and Americanism. It was revulsion. I mean, revulsion uh, 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 leaps off the page. Um, the man who becomes Europeanized is a silly and undesirable man, um, uh, over-civilized, <laughs> over-civilized, over-refined. I think he, uh, 104 years before the uh, formation of the common currency, the euro, he, he sort of had a prescience about that. But uh, <laughs> let's talk about the 4th of July, uh, the 4th of July, which in America, uh, it's, it's uh, Independence Day, and it's a... It's, again, it's a family, it's a local holiday, locally expressed, um, but we have a, a, a military history, we have a martial history, we have had expansionist and imperialistic phases in our history. Um, so there it is all over America, um, uh, hamburgers and balloons and little fire trucks and little par mini parades. Go to France and go to Paris on Bastille Day and see what they do with their um, I, I think uh, analogous holiday. There's a never-ending military parade down the Champs uh, Elysees, and that's what they do, and that's the way they see themselves. Falsely, of course. Um, um. <laughs> <laughs> and the kids, of course, play with mini guillotines. <laughs> <laughs> Can I make one point? I didn't read the first objection in the speech as one against the family. I saw it as being anti-regional. Regionalism was obviously a problem in the post-Civil War era. And of the three objections in the speech, it's the least relevant today. If anything, we are lamenting the loss of realism with a national culture, a mass media where accents, cuisine, local customs are sort of overcome and almost wiped out. You know, everybody says you, you go to another city, you, you, you go down a strip mall. It could be any city. So if anything, we have solved the regionalism issue. If anything, we've overdone it and created a mass culture which suppresses sort of the charm and the, uh, and the attractiveness of regionalism. But he's very acute and pressing it in the other objections about internationalism, and he's right that it's silly. It's not pernicious. It's naive and idiotic rather than being, <laughs> rather than being in any way sort of evil or, or malicious simply an idea of the lion and the lamb happening in our lifetime, which is obviously adolescent and childish. And, but the last, I think, is the most interesting, the one where he objects to this ethnic uh, separatism, not regional or local, ge geographic separatism. That isn't an issue, but it was this uh, separatism which occurs in, in different parts of the country, but among common ethnicities, which he saw as a threat. And I think it was extremely prescient and acute. If anything, the difference is in his day, the federal government and the national ethos wanted uh, to suppress that separatism. The, the reason it's such an epidemic today is because the mass, uh, the sort of political class and the media celebrates this separatism, the universities everywhere, so that if you want to oppose it, you are going against sort of uh, conventional wisdom, and that makes it all the more difficult to overcome in our day, and that's why just, just it's, to, it's our problem. Just to yeah. clarify, I do understand he did not condemn you know, the family, but he did unequivocally say patriotism of the village and the belfry, those two things, are bad. And I don't think we can gloss over that. When you, when you say unequivocally something is bad, and you look at the core, of what the village or the belfry is. We, we, uh, we don't uh, pledge really, allegiance yeah. um, to the great city of Atlanta. So, so the question is, why did he do this? Why did he say these things? I think what Leon's uh, excerpts and this conversation has made clear is that Roosevelt's speech is uh, brutally exclusionary. And Roosevelt was an intelligent person, and I think he probably was well aware uh, of the harshness of some of the things he was saying. So why was he doing it? And it seems to me that, that Roosevelt was wrestling with uh, tensions and a problem 
that is uh, always present when trying to come to grips with the United States. Uh, it was the same tensions that uh, existed in 1789. I mean, the country had fought the Revolutionary War, come together, freed ourselves from the British, and then we arrive in Philadelphia, and we all are, know what the obvious tensions were there. And this is a country that, of its nature, is diverse, and it's a country that's centrifugal. And the question was, how do you hold it together? What idea do you try to look for to hold all of these different kinds of people together? And I'd like to um, align Roosevelt with um, someone else who was addressing this subject uh, back then. That was uh, uh, Frederick Jackson Turner, the historian. Interestingly enough, Roosevelt's speech was given in 1894. Turner, in 1893, gave a very famous speech to the American Historical Association, and it was on the idea of the American frontier. Uh, I'm going to read a quick excerpt from it, because it's, to me, a kind of astonishing how much it tracks uh, what Roosevelt was saying. Turner said he admired that practical, inventive turn of mind, quick to find expedients, that masterful grasp of material things, lacking in the artistic but powerful to effect great ends, that restless nervous energy, that dominant individualism, working for good and for evil, that, Turner said, are the traits of the frontier. And that certainly, in my mind, describes Teddy Roosevelt. And I think it was Roosevelt, that was with Turner, trying to find an idea of America that was different. And I think it resides in the idea of the frontier that pulls a diverse people together for a, a common purpose. And in Roosevelt's time in 1894, heavens knows, the Industrial Revolution, the country was just in ferment with all of these new immigrants coming. So I think the kind of, in a sense, brutality of Roosevelt's speech was intended to try to push to the side these threats to the basic American idea that always uh, is under these, uh, these centrifugal tensions. There's something to be said, too, for energy. Um, um, it, it's true, I think, that uh, our uh, Americanism uh, derives from our uh, proposition, the proposition, proposition that all men are created equal, we find at the beginning of the Declaration of Independence. But uh, at the end, uh, you have the uh, uh, signers of the Declaration pledging their lives, their uh, fortunes, and their sacred honor. Uh, uh, to which someone once said, uh, uh, the meaning of the Declaration says that all are <coughs> created equal, especially the undersigned. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you know, that, that uh, creates a difference between uh, the beneficiaries of uh, the principle of equality and the, uh, those who actually promote it and who use energy to sustain it, uh, so, such that you might uh, <coughs> say that there are uh, levels of true Americanism the, that uh, at, at the weakest level, is, it would be any human being, because uh, any human being is potentially an American, if the principle says all, all human beings are created equal. But then, uh, stronger than that, there would be the believers in the principle that uh, all men are created equal, and stronger still than that would be the practitioners of it. And I think this is uh, where, where energy comes in, and, and especially the energy of, of self-government. Our, ours is, uh, our, our, our country is not only devoted to liberty as a principle, but we practice it, and we've practiced it successfully. And our Constitution has enabled us to do it uh, successfully. It's the first republic that works. Uh, I think our uh, framers of the Constitution for understood that um, the, this, uh, this Constitution had to overcome all the defects, <coughs> the difficulties and ills of republics that had existed before, including the Roman, which after all turned into an empire. So uh, how, how could you uh, re resolve that uh, uh, problem? You had to have a, 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 a special kind of, a new kind of Constitution in which people practice their liberty. What is great about America is that it practices what it preaches. But, but wouldn't that then, wouldn't you make an argument on behalf of the locality as the place where that energy of self-government is really most felt? In other words, I mean, he seems to want to direct everything really to the few, those who are going to expand it, who are going to turn it into an empire, as opposed to those who are more sort of conservative and remain in their, in their villages, but really do undertake the task of governing themselves. 
I don't see energy as uniquely American. You want to talk about energy, uh, I think it was Kissinger who once said that Russia expanded uh, by the equivalent of, of a, Belgian, a Belgium every year for 200 years. Uh, that's energy. Um, it was not, <laughs> it was hardly American. Uh, it seems to me that the idea about equality, uh, you know, all men are created equal is the, the fundamental axiom, but the operative political phrase in the Declaration is a government, uh, is the life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The, the Constitution's intent is to create a structure that will protect that. I grew up in Canada where the founding constitution, the DNA Act, the BNA Act of 1867, defines the purpose of that constitution as peace, order, and good government. Uh, think of how different that is from life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which is a kind of a trinity expressing aspects of the same idea. It's all about liberty. And that's what makes us different from every other country. We've. Um one, do you want to get in on, on this? I, I would like to then move the conversation as it's already moving on its own, uh, leaving Teddy Roosevelt behind, but to begin to talk about what we ourselves think Americanism is today, um, no longer the day of the frontier. Please. Well, I think it's important to say that I think the context in which Roosevelt wrote this was a surge in terms of immigration, uh, and that he was not speaking specifically to the family uh, he was speaking to the idea that people would become locked into localities or regional taste and attitudes, especially in the aftermath of the Civil War. But the key, I suspect, was the surge in terms of immigration. And in picking up on something that Amy said earlier, this is really why this document matters so much to us today. Today you have a situation in which the demographers especially after the 2010 census, no longer speak, as has been said, of the great American melting pot, but instead talk about things like the great American mosaic, in which there are people of all sorts and variety and colors making up, the, making up America, but even more so, and I think more troublingly, of the great American salad bowl, in which you have very distinct pieces and parts like the tomatoes, the lettuce, the carrots, uh, that retain their distinct identities even as they're working together to make the American experience one, the, the nutritious salad, if you will. I guess you could think of me as some kind of fuzzy-headed carrot sitting up here. Um, but to me, it is essential that you say very clearly, and I think this is one of Roosevelt's points, very clearly that the idea is that you would become American. And the reason I think this is so highly relevant uh, and, and the context is important in terms of immigration is that we are experiencing another surge in terms of immigration today. <clears throat> and the example that Amy gave of her class at the very start of those young people who identify themselves as so-called hyphenated Americans, it's, it's because it is chic these days uh, to insist that, you know what, I retain my national, my, my native identity. I was born somewhere else, and I retain that identity. I retain that language. I retain that attitude, rather than giving myself up, giving myself over, in terms of marriage almost, to becoming an American, to assimilation. Assimilation has become a dirty word in so many quarters in this country today. And the idea is that why would you give up who you are, that you, who you are authentically is not to be dedicated to the American ideal. And I happen to agree with Roosevelt in terms of conviction and purpose. I think it's very clear that if you adopt an American mindset, it is about conviction and purpose and determination and this idea of equality. Now, I say this as a black person, and I think this is very critical because he is writing as if black people don't exist in his document. He's really writing to the Irish, he's writing to the German, uh, I think he may be writing you know, to the Italian, but I'm not even sure the Italian is included in his document. Um, and if you look at the recent census numbers, what they indicate is that the heart and soul of growth in this country today uh, is largely Hispanic. I think it's the case, I think, if you look at where areas of growth have taken place, it's like 80% of the population surge has been Hispanic or black, but it's, large, it's minority growth, even throughout 
the South. I'm not just talking California and New York. I'm talking about places like uh, Senator Alexander's Hamlin County in Tennessee, you know, being 10% Hispanic, or you go to Minneapolis, known for its homogeneity of white people, and then all of a sudden, here you have Hmong and Somalis, and you say, oh my gosh, how did these communities become not only so large, but oftentimes cloistered, that you can go into those communities, and here's something that I find terribly concerning to me, is that in the Mexican households, the Dominican Republic households, you're getting to the point where 90% of them don't speak English at home. They speak Spanish. And it's also true that if you go into some Asian communities in San Francisco and the like, they don't speak English at home. When they are at home, when they're relaxed, when they consider themselves their true or authentic selves, they're not identifying with America. They've got calling cards to call back home. They've got the internet to reach back <coughs> home. And in so many ways, this complicates the task of assimilation. This is so different than Roosevelt's day. Obviously, all these mechanisms didn't exist. But I think this is what he is writing to. He is saying, you have to agree. You know, to my mind, the, the American who goes overseas and becomes intoxicated with being a cosmopolitan and European, uh, you know, I think that's almost secondary. I think the heart and soul of the essay is about the need to say, I am an American, and I identify with America, and I identify with its precepts and with the Declaration, and I especially identify with the idea that we hold some exceptional role, and I am wed to it, and willing to fight and defend it and speak and advocate for it. Well, if you're moving on to what exactly what, what we mean on on the, I don't think we should get too distracted by Roosevelt's emphasis on the national government as opposed to the community. That's just, you know, I don't agree. I think we work community by community. He was a very big, strong. He, he might like the strong central government we have today. I think this essence of what he talked about was what he was against, which is what politicians often do. It's a lot easier to talk about what you're against than what you're for. And if you're moving on to what, what it means to be an American, building on what, 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 Juan, what Juan said, the essence of, 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 of our national identity is that you have to become, you must become an American if you want to be a citizen. You can't become French. You can't become Chinese. So how do you become American? You become American one way, by pledging allegiance to a creed of beliefs <coughs> that most of us hold in common. Now, most of our politics, Samuel Huntington said, was about conflicts among those beliefs and dealing with <coughs> the unrealized aspirations that we have. All men are created equal. But we pretty well agree on what the principles are. Equal opportunity, liberty, rule of law, some other things. And we define in our law, and we have ever since the revolution, what it means to be an American. I mean, if you'd read, if Amy would read to her class and ask them if they knew that a million new citizens every year take an oath that starts out by saying, I declare that I absolutely and entirely renounce and abjure all allegiance and fidelity to any foreign prince, potentate, state, or sovereignty of whom or which I have heretofore been a subject or citizen. That's the beginning of the oath that George Washington and his men took at Valley Forge and that a million new citizens take today. And we require, have required in the law since 1906 that you must speak English. There are 100 questions on a citizenship test that you must, and they're mostly about the Declaration, the Constitution, that you must, you must answer. So, so there's a pretty good understanding that what makes us exceptional is a single thing that we are united by a set of ideas. And that's what it takes to become an American. And then after that, uh, what we do best at is apparently what your book seems to do, which is instead of an enforced Americanism, the worst example of which would be McCarthyism, spontaneous patriotism, the best example of which are flags after 9-11, perhaps your book, uh, 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 reading the letters from revolutionary soldiers, uh, going to a naturalization ceremony in a federal courthouse, just discovering uh, what it means to America. But we, but it's defined in the law what it means to be an American, and it's united, united. We, we're united by a creed, and if we, and if, if we don't have that, we, we, we are a United Nations instead of a United States of America. Someone respond, Bill. Oh, I, I was just going to to move uh, move it into. Uh, 
talking about a specific topic, but still along the lines that you're talking about, it, and that is the public schools. Uh, Roosevelt is strongly, uh, un, in, completely unambiguously, categorically endorses public schools uh, as they existed, as the ideal existed in his day. I suspect that you could probably divide this room down the middle uh, as to whether people would concur in that view, even if they concurred otherwise in everything that, that Juan said so, so well. Um, the problem being we, we don't have a consensus anymore about what it means to be an American, and we ha have no confidence that the public schools will convey uh, that consensus if it existed. Um, to me, it, it's epitomized by the fact that uh, the county of Los Angeles, California, which also has one of the worst uh, school systems in the country, teaches, it has instruction in over 100 languages. Uh, so the requirement uh, of the use of English is out, and uh, with it is, I think, a particular understanding of what it means to be an American, and, or, the, or the credibility of the public schools as a means of inculcating that. Uh, so is the liberty uh, that is part of our sort of fundamental uh, makeup as a nation, does it involve the right to educate your children any way you please, including vouchers, public, uh, private schools, a mix of various things? Or is it the move back towards this much more um, robust notion of public education that Roosevelt seems to be advocating? Look, I mean, it's, it's very clear that the question of, of uh, what it means to be an American is um, either contested or ignored. Um, and, many, and while it's true, as the senator says, all new immigrants who undergo the naturalization ceremony do take this oath of allegiance, but the children of the native born <coughs> don't do so. And the Constitution uh, on the subject of citizenship simply defines us uh, as those who are born in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction of the United States or a, or a particular state and subject to the jurisdiction of the laws. There, there's no criteria for citizenship. There are no duties of citizenship mentioned. Um, it's, it seems to me for this panel, um, intelligent, thoughtful people who care about the subject to undertake a little bit of work to see if we can pull together some of the things that have been said in our own name, leaving Teddy Roosevelt um, uh, to, the, to, um, to, to the side and, and see what we can make of this. Robbie began with the Declaration of Independence, as Robbie so often does. Uh, Charles prefers the Constitution, which is the constituting document. Um, not necessarily saying that those two documents are in tension with each other, but he prefers th that which we have covenanted to uh, agree with. Harvey reminds us that, um, uh, you know, lots of people could uh, agree with those principles. Uh, um, some people um, might even endorse them, but it's uh, more than a cognitive matter to choose to live by them, that it requires uh, commitment, energy, uh, matters of the heart and spirit. Uh, Dan Henniger points out that um, uh, there's a tension in the United States uh, going back to the beginning about making one out of many, um, partly because the country is so big, partly because it's, there, there are multiple and rival interests and in different religions. Um, and in a certain way, as uh, Bill reminds us, uh, the very liberty the very liberty to pursue your individualistic notions of, uh, uh, of happiness um, it, it has also a centrifugal um, tendency. And the question is whether it, I mean, ultimately the question is, does it matter if all of us go about minding our own business, we're doing the American thing, but we don't think of ourselves in any um, rich way or any uh, robust way as Americans as opposed to South Siders of the city of Chicago who root for the White Sox. Um, so I, I wonder if we could try to uh, address some of these uh, s some of these different strands and see whether we could um, uh, do a little more in our own name. Um, could I, please. Yeah, not, not the question why it matters. No, not yet why, why it matters, but but what it is. I mean, I'd, I'd like to explore. Um, uh, the issue in a little bit of detail of uh, the uh, impact of uh, economic freedom and this this magnificent and uh, fabulous uh, uh, migration of the founding principles um, uh, all men are created equal um, imperfect but the migration into um, 
perhaps not what it means to be an American, but uh, the characteristics of Americans, uh, focusing on a couple of industries. Um, um, the internet. Um, uh, th many people remember that in the uh, 1960s, perhaps 70s, France came up with something um, a national, I, I think it was called the Minitel, and it was, uh, and it was going to take over the world, and uh, it was just uh, an expression of French um, uh, uh, grandiosity, actually. Um, kind of didn't work, was completely useless, didn't develop, and uh, now if you have one, it's a, it's a, I'm sure it's going to be a terrific uh, museum piece. Um, it's not just that the, um, that the, uh, that, uh, the internet uh, was and is an American uh, 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 invention, product development, but I believe it was, it could only have been an American um, um, product, the product of the meritocracy, the product, uh, imperfect meritocracy, but, but the envy of the world. Um, um, but I know more um, uh, about, and the, the internet has transformed the world and continues to do so. I know more about the industry of which I'm a part, the hedge fund industry, but it illustrates uh, many of the same uh, uh, principles. Um, I'm a lawyer by formal training, uh, and um, the, uh, when I formed a hedge fund in 1977, there was, a, there was a history of hedge funds, but what a hedge fund, what the hedge fund industry is, is a pool of basically unconstrained, but subject to uh, rules and regulations about um, uh, 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 accounting standards, fraud, um, subject to the control of uh, lenders. Um, unconstrained meaning you're not part of a herd, you're not part of a group that, uh, that, uh, that uh, measures success by losing 20% when the world loses 30% or failure when you make 20 and the, and the world uh, makes 30. But you have your own money alongside investors, um, uh, most of the people who now run hedge funds are the product of middle class backgrounds. Um, uh, many of them went, uh, including myself, public schools, um, um, send our kids to public schools. Um, and from this, uh, from this uh, the, the, the growth of this unconstrained, free form investing style has come a, a group of people very rapidly that are now um, the new rank of people who are involved in policy, politics, philanthropy, entrepreneurial philanthropy. Um, and I, I think the hedge fund industry, as well as the internet, illustrates something that, that is very uh, closely related uh, uh, because of the, the, the need for America as, um, uh, to, to, to bounce back from its problems and the, the self-imposed, self-made problems of the last 30 and 40 years, some of them cultural, uh, many of them uh, R Robbie has been writing about for a, a long time. But um, to generate the prosperity uh, in a world in which our folks in general are paid a lot more than uh, uh, people in emerging uh, economies, it is a product of the openness, the meritocracy, the rule of law, um, uh, the, um, the fairness, basic fairness of the American system. It's not a corrupt system. The police force in most places is not corrupt. The, the, the mayors and uh, uh, we, we all know what happens around the world and America continues to be. Um, uh, things need to be fixed. But I think the, all of this that I'm discussing is a product of something deeper than just people happening to be in this location. It's, it's part of an idea, and uh, uh, America, has, of course, was founded on an idea, and one of the ideas was freedom, uh, uh, economic freedom, private property, uh, and individual responsibility. And um, um, uh, I think it's worth giving some thought, um, whether uh, on this panel or not, uh, into what is the connection between that ability of Americans to do these remarkable things um, and to keep this prosperity going, uh, and what it means to be an American and Americanism. Dan? And Leon, I would just like to, uh, in terms of what it is, uh, align myself. I think uh, the fellow who has put his finger on it is Harvey Mansfield, when he said that America practices its liberty. Um, I mean, there's such a thing as abstract mathematics, and there's applied mathematics, and liberty can be discussed in abstractions, to be sure. 
but I think Harvey's right that the defining characteristic is that every day the United States practices its liberty and it does it within the context of both the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. Uh, everybody knows the phrase life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We, have, we were given this extraordinary template by the founders. And you know, I, I don't know, like almost every day one can think how really lucky we were that those guys <laughs> were who they were back <clears throat> in those times. Um, America just lucked out with an incredible group of men called the Founding Fathers who gave us this template within which we do at the local level, in school boards, in local elections, state and national elections, within the framework of the Constitution, constantly practice our liberty. But it's done within a structure that they gave us. And I think that just of its nature, the founders have allowed us to be pulled forward in this habit, which is, is wholly constructive. Frank. I, I wonder to the, the uh, Senator, I appreciate you reading the, the, the words from the oath that, that the new citizens take. I went to a naturalization ceremony of a friend recently, and it's really a beautiful and moving reminder of what we are as Americans. I'm, I'm wondering, I, th I think, Leon, you pointed out that, that those born here you know, do not take that oath. Right. It, given, given what we're talking about in terms of desiring some level want to what you spoke about, common agreement about what we are as Americans, what we're dedicated to. Is it worth considering whether when you register to vote, you agree to take that oath? I mean, do, do, we, do we as Americans want to give the right to vote to anyone who, we're not willing to give citizenship to, to someone who came from a foreign land if they won't take that oath. Ought we to demand that uh, for someone to vote? I wonder if I could just take 60 seconds. I was at a meeting one. The, the answer to that is that's what the public school is supposed to do. But it's not an oath. No, we don't no, take no, an oath. But, but I was at a meeting of educators one time, and some uh, and, and Monk, Monk Malloy, who was the head of Notre Dame, asked, what's the rationale for a public school? And Albert Shanker, who was the former head of the American Federation of Teachers, says that the public school was created to teach immigrant children reading, writing, and arithmetic and what it means to be an American with the hope they would go home and teach their parents. So the only, ration, only real rationale for the common school or public school was to help the children learn what it meant to be an American. Otherwise, they could all be private. Dan, let me ask you, if I, uh, uh, Robbie, did you want to get in? Well, well not, not just on this point, but more, more broadly. Uh, we're in the midst right now of a big debate in this country not so much about true Americanism, uh, but rather the question, not unrelated, what is the true America? Uh, we are in a debate about whether America should be modeled on the social democracies of Europe, whether America should aspire to be a kind of libertarian utopia, where we just each go about pursuing our individual uh, aims and uh, uh, law should be just restricted to keeping us from bumping into each other or violating each other's uh, rights. This is, a, this is a very big debate, and this might be a very good context in which to uh, address it. Uh, well, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't uh, rule it out of court, Robbie, but it, it seems to me that um, uh, there are always going to be large political differences between, um, uh, so let's say liberals and conservatives about which way the government or which way America should go on particular policy questions or even on larger visions. And, and yet there is a sense um, that uh, those, those debates take place within a context of, of, of somehow shared commitments, shared beliefs, shared attachments. Um, and uh, it's uh, I think it would be better, at least for present purposes, to try to think about what those things in common are, uh, recognizing that, in fact, what Roosevelt at the end talks about um, uh, sh shoulder to sh shoulder working together f uh, to solve these problems, not expecting that there would be a unanimous opinion about you know, how to do those things. So, um, I mean, rather, to get, rather than get into the current policy debates, I would prefer, if, if you wouldn't mind, to stay really with but oh yeah, I'm not, I'm not so much interested in addressing the policy debates here as the, uh, 
as the ideals, the ideals that we, okay. we should be uh, committed to. Please. Okay, let, let me try this. I mean, I think the basic American proposition, as expressed initially in the Declaration of Independence and then as fleshed out in the Constitution, which, which establishes the institutions by which we hope to effectuate the ideals that are put forth in the, in the Declaration, uh, the, the basic principles of government that would respond to those uh, ideals are principles of limited government, of liberty, of personal uh, responsibility. Uh, they also, though, require a kind of public spiritedness because it is a republican regime. Self-government does mean that we need citizens who are concerned not only with pursuing their own individual aims, but also with pursuing something substantive by way, of the, by way of the common good. Now, we can have all sorts of debates about what that requires as far as policy is concerned, how the pension system should be set up, how Social Security should be reformed, and so forth and so on. But I think one problem is that you've got major threats to these ideals, like limited government, like personal responsibility, uh, from the rejection by large segments, especially of the most influential uh, people in the culture, especially the intellectual culture, uh, rejections of the legitimacy of some of those uh, ideals. And this, I think, is why multiculturalism in its strong sense, the multiculturalism that rejects as illegitimate and unjust uh, a program of assimilation, is a real threat. I think this is why cosmopolitanism which, uh, which uh, holds patriotism uh, in contempt is such a real threat. And you, you find the strong multiculturalist sentiment, the cosmopolitanist uh, sentiment uh, in, I would argue, an ascendant position uh, in the intellectual culture and increasingly uh, in the public schools and not simply the public schools. One of my children went to a very good private school where I struggled valiantly to get him excused from a mandatory class in American studies because the sole text in the mandatory class in this very good private school in American studies was Howard Zinn's History of the American People. Uh, I actually wouldn't have objected to the book being used had something been said on the other side of these great questions. But since uh, it was the sole text, it looked to me like indoctrination in anti-Americanism rather than a course on uh, American studies. But that such a thing would be a problem we would have to address in a very good suburban private school and all over the place, of course, in the public schools, I think should give us grave concern. Well, you're years ahead of me. I had a son, my son went to private school. Charles. I think I lost my, no, I just got it back. Here it is. Uh, you had an easy time in simply trying to get your son out of a class <laughs> in a very Tony private school. I, I spent the five years on the education the committee of, of my son's school trying to introduce American history before the ninth grade. He had two courses on the Incas. In <laughs> I, I thought he, he would end up speaking Inca <laughs> by the time he got to high school. It took me five years to introduce a course in the eighth grade on American history. And then I'm sure after I left that they probably used Zinn as a text, but <laughs> I was already gone and retired. I just want to make one point on terminology. I think Americanism is a rather quaint term. Right. It was one that you'd use 100 years ago. I think the reason we don't use it now is because it had an un unfortunate adolescence in which it was used by nasty people to destroy lives. And that's why I think in the general culture, you know, it's a perfectly reasonable word because of the baggage of its history, un you know, House Un-American Activities Committee, etc. cetera. I, to me, it's the, 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 the equivalent of American exceptionalism. I think that's our way of saying the same thing. Americanism as an ism, uh, uh, can, I think is what we mean when we talk about American exceptionalism. What makes us different from Europe, from Rome, from Greece, from other democracies, other advanced industrial societies? So I think this is, I think what we're having is a discussion about American exceptionalism. But uh, perhaps there are other uh, views of this. John, but I, still I think is there something uh, American about it? So as to prevent it from being cosmopolitan, uh, 
Um, it's true, I think, that uh, the idea of a citizen of the world is silly, but uh, why? We need to have some reason. For, for the same yeah. reason Esperanto is silly. <laughs> well, but, yeah, all right, so you can't have uh, high-level conversation with, mm -hmm. at, at the, with a primitive uh, language that, uh, that simplifies everything. Well, it, it wasn't a primitive. I think Esperanto was a primitive idea well, it, that you, you could somehow transcend nationality, ethnicity, and heritage and create sort of as, out of the sheer rationality universal language. I mean, I find it amusing, uh, uh, but at, in the same way that I find uh, this kind of internationalism that we have today, this idea that uh, the UN's edicts carry a kind of moral authority that American, uh, that American decisions wouldn't, that we have to rely on the Security Council or the UN Human Rights Commission in deciding what to do and what not to do abroad is also a silly idea. I just think that, I, I think that's less of a problem than the division within our country that TR was talking about of uh, being torn apart by this sort of ethnic separatism, which I think is now intrinsic in our culture and, and getting worse. Uh, Lam, uh, I think I can tie a few points here together. I think there's a kind of unavoidably contemporary political issue that's raised by this discussion, and it's the one that Diana talked about at the outset, which was that Roosevelt, in the way he's speaking, is clearly talking about a country somewhat like imperial Rome. And I think that in 1894, if I can read try to read Roosevelt, give a fair reading of his mind, I think that Roosevelt understood in 1894 that the United States was on the verge of becoming a very great and powerful nation, which in fact it did, and it became what we now call a superpower. And I think Roosevelt understood that a country that was heading in that direction was going to need, it was going to take a lot of effort to sustain whatever would be necessary to maintain that status. You know, we've had debates for a long time over whether that status is appropriate or not, but it's real. That's the way it is. And after World War II, there was no denying that it was real. And I think what Roosevelt was talking about was the point that, that Charles raised, which was energy. How do you sustain the economic, the spiritual, and the physical energy to keep <coughs> America a great nation? And the reason this is a political issue, and we're going to get partisan here now, is that we just had this sort of interesting, much talked about article in the New Yorker about the uh, Obama administration's foreign policy, the key of which is the final paragraph in which the writer says in talking to the Obama foreign policy people, two ideas emerged, one of which was the unspoken belief that the relative power of the United States is declining as rivals like China rise. And as this spokesman said, this is also at odds with the John Wayne expectation of what America is in the world, but it's necessary for shepherding us through this phase. This is absolutely the antithesis of what Teddy Roosevelt was talking about, right? And it implies, I think, all of these other things that we're talking about that go into what makes America strong. And at this point in time, you've got a school of thought that clearly is, you know, explicitly or not aligned with the cosmopolitanism that Roosevelt so abhorred. And I think that was the reason he abhorred it. He knew it would weaken the United States relative to the rest of the world. Well, I think that's part of the, the reason. Uh, but he refers to the nation as a federal republic. I think he does that more than, more than once, a federal republic. Uh, and to go back to, to, to Harvey's point, I mean, one of the things about America is that it is a self-government self is one of our ideas. We want to be a self-governing people. There are conditions for self-government. You can do it in a federal republic. Self-government is possible in a federal republic. I don't know how self-government is possible on cosmopolitan terms. In the cosmopolitan world, it seems to me we're back to rulers and subjects. Now, the rulers might not be kings. We have different names for them. Uh, but they'll be, you know, in places like Belgium and The Hague, uh, and the rest of us will be subjects, and we're expected to be happy if they make life for us soft and, and comfortable. And Roosevelt certainly isn't interested in soft and comfortable. He's interested in a self-governing people, and that means it's going to have to be the context of a federal republic. 
<laughs> yeah, I think that's perfectly correct. That, uh, American does mean self-government. But American also means, uh, and that's a principle, and it comes from the principle of the equality of men, you could say. But America also is something particular. <coughs> it's an attachment. It is a particular Oh, sure. With a, with a history and a culture and yeah. traditions. And, yeah. so, uh, and that works against the universality of our <coughs> principles. Somehow we have to combine our, 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 the, uh, the universal love of self-government and recommendation of it to other, other peoples because we don't think that it's just good for us. Our, our very principle tells us that uh, it's not because we're American and or, you know, that, that we uh, have a special right and, 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 and gift uh, to practice self-government. No, we recommend it to others. They can imitate us. But I think there's, there, that r reveals a kind of constant difficulty of, uh, of a kind of imperialism. Because it's a universal principle, we think that others uh, should practice it too. We don't just live our principles, we tout them to the rest of the world. And so uh, something like the imperialism that America was on the edge of and that uh, Teddy Roosevelt uh, had a hand in well, is, a, is a constant uh, temptation. So we have to show how it is that uh, a, a self-government can also be a limited government, limited in its ambitions as well as in its, um, um, its republicanism. It's well, interesting. Isn't, isn't it limited Sorry. because it relies on the consent of those others? So we can provide an example of self-government, but we can't impose it because it is up to their consent to secure it for themselves. In other words, it seems to me there, if you, if you properly understand the original principles, there is a limitation upon that kind of uh, imposition on the world. And yet, ironically, we impose it on the Japanese and the Germans, and it took. <laughs> and we have trouble with the Arabs. And uh, I think, you know, to my mind, you have to, at some point in defining what it is, say that you know Americans continue, people from around the world continue to flock to these shores. They want to get into this country any and every way that they can. And maybe a simple way to address this question of what it is is to simply say, well, why are you coming here in such great numbers? Why are you dying to get in here? Why do you do anything to send your children here? And I think then the answer becomes rather clear that people still greatly value the idea of freedom from oppression uh, and that the idea of law and order and rule of law is extremely valuable. I think people love the idea of social stability without reference to tribalism. Uh, you know, we talked about these hyphenated kids, but in terms of the courts and our politics, you know, if you get outside of some of the big cities, that is not the rule of the day. Uh, that is not the way that people order themselves in our society. And of course, upward mobility. Uh, the, those public schools, in addition to being vehicles for assimilating young people, really gives you an opportunity in the ideal sense to exhibit merit. And that in the United States, you can come here as a poor child, and if you exhibit merit through hard work and determination and the like persistence, you can achieve, you can rise. That, you know, you know, people mock the idea that anybody can become president, but you know it's true that you know if you look at not only Bill Clinton but Barack Obama, you'd say that's amazing that that person became president of any country, uh, and it's inspiring. Now, I think that part of this conversation, I regretted that it went political because it seems to me to take the Teddy Roosevelt document totally out of context. We live in such a different world. Than, this, than the world that this document was written for. The, the expanse of the American military, the way that we intervene not only in Iraq and Afghanistan and the idea that terrorists would come here, that, that we would have something to say about events in Libya and Syria, this is way outside of what Roosevelt is imagining as he's writing here. Um, and the idea that we would have NAFTA and GATT and, world, and that we have a global economic structure or an internet. Yeah, I mean, so to me, I mean, you guys are acting as if, you know, we should flock quickly back to days of yore, and I am glad to honor them, but I don't think that it is relevant to this, and I think the idea that you would talk about multinational coalitions and agreements in some negative way 
isn't, isn't, I don't think it's relevant. He may have had it. Could, 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 can, I go, could, could I just make, Charles mentioned something I think was especially interesting. I mean, we, we imposed what we're talking about on the Japanese and the Germans, but that didn't make them Americans. We, we did we did impose a great deal on what it seems to me that that what is exceptional about America still is that we are united by a set of principles instead of by race creed color what, what, whatever that 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 is that is unique that's our greatest accomplishment and then the next thing is which principles liberty equality rule of law few of them derive from these few documents and that's about it. I mean, after that, we discover it for our, ourselves. But, what, what, but the single thing that is unique and exceptional is that we're united by a handful of principles instead of something else. Well, um, I mean, putting these two comments together and formulating a question, I don't think anybody on the panel, one was uh, nostalgic for um, Teddy Roosevelt's time. I don't, I don't think I've heard any comment. Uh, but um, there's an attempt to see whether some of the questions he raised are still questions for us, uh, notwithstanding the large differences of the times. And uh, Senator, convictions, uh, I was very struck by this, this phrase, spirit, convictions, and purposes. Um, uh, intellectuals uh, and professors are very good on convictions and principles. Harvey Mansfield is good on that and other things besides, so he talks about spiritedness and so on. But um, it's a funny thing to wonder uh, in the present age with American power what it is. Could we speak about uh, American national purpose? Does it matter whether we have one? Um, Harvey Mansfield suggests um, we not only practice liberty, but um, with Diana's uh, important qualification, we advertise it and recommend it to others because we believe it's good. I was going to ask Harvey whether he thought that is today America's national purpose. Mm -hmm. It's not imperialism, except of, of a way of life and encouragement that others follow it. But um, it makes sense to ask the question of a, of a mighty nation, what are you about? And it also makes a question, it seems to ask of the citizens, what is the guiding spirit, as well as what abstract propositions do you hold? And it seems to be worth, uh, worth a few minutes well, on that. And then I think, in, well, let's go, in, go back talking. to what, where the, when the nation was at its gravest risk, right? During the Civil War, when the question was whether people who had lived to see the nation born would still be alive when it, when it died. Lincoln told us what our national uh, purpose was uh, when he said that what the war was about was uh, whether government of the people, by the people, and for the people, in other words, Republican government, would perish from, now there he didn't say the North American landmass, he said would perish from the earth. The national purpose of the United States was to show that despite the historical failures of Republican government and the temptation to believe that Republican government simply was a nice idea that could never work and that it would be eternally the fate of human beings to be uh, ruled by accident and force. That it was America's national purpose Robbie, to show that it could Robbie, it, it that's could fine. And uh, one, when you spoke about what uh, Americanism is, you repaired to some of those, uh, s some of the same things, some of the principles that we hold dear and have held dear since the Declaration of Independence. But the question that I think is implicitly raised by what Dan was saying, as well as what several other people were saying, including yourself, is there have been waves and waves of immigration, arguably more in the past four decades than ever before from every corner of the globe. And uh, unlike before, hyphenated Americans do exist, and they do uh, seem to want to retain two different loyalties. Now, even though they have to pledge that they will give up loyalty to one, they seem to recognize themselves as two. So the question that I, that I think would, that Leon is asking, and that I think we should ask more sharply, do we really live in different times? 
Do we need a different answer to the question of what is the spirit, the conviction, the purpose of America? I don't see how that changes uh, uh, anything. I mean, our fundamental problem today is that not immigrants from the Ukraine will retain their loyalty to the Ukraine. I, I don't see that's our problem. I mean, the question is, when we, when we educate, uh, when we form uh, immigrants or children of native-born citizens to be Americans, what are we forming them to be? What are we teaching them? Are we teaching them that Howard Zinn's America is the true America? Or are we teaching them a different vision? and understanding of America. And I think that's the whole ballgame. And it seems to me that our intellectual class has largely sided, taken one side on that. That's the, the, the Howard Zinn side on that. And I personally don't think that's the right side to take. So I think part of my own mission, what I perceive as part of my own mission, is to make the argument for the other side. Well, I think that it's not the case, Robert, that you can ignore inequities in American life and try to say that we are engaged in propagandizing in order to indoctrinate our young people to be more American. To the contrary, and, and Roosevelt spoke about this, you know, he's talked about people who would use our inequities to try to belittle the United States, and it's even worse than to try to belittle the idea of the United States, of America. That's not the goal. But you could not speak to me and say, oh, America is without flaw. America knows nothing of slavery, nothing of segregation. You cannot speak to a Jewish person and say no, America knows nothing about glass ceilings and acting as if you are less than fully human. Now this is not true. So to me, part of the glory of America is that we work through these things, that people absolutely continue to aspire to this idea that you spoke about in the second line of the Declaration of Independence, all men equal. And that we really see this and we really pursue it. And that we really hold each other to account in a very public way. Uh, that you can campaign, Senator Alexander can campaign, but he must also acknowledge that there are people who are living in poverty in Appalachia, that there are black people who are not, you know, that many generations removed from slavery in his constituency. This is all part of America. But oh, it makes yeah. us very different than so many other lands where they don't acknowledge this, where they continue to lie about who they are or try to persuade people that they don't have problems. That's not us. Juan, you don't disagree with me uh, because there's no argument for me or from anyone on the panel that would say that America, America, America's failures or inequities whether current or past, should be glossed over or hidden. We, we want people to know the whole thing. We want our children, whether immigrant children or children of native-born Americans, to know the whole story. And that does include some very dark moments that we should be ashamed of. But you're also right that, that our confronting them, our working always toward uh, realizing our ideals is, is part, of the, part of the story. I mean, even the story of the public schools, right? We, if we're going to tell the true story of the public schools, we've got to tell the story of anti-Catholicism. I, th I think it's no accident that the that the bishops responded by creating a, a system of Catholic schools because there were people who wanted to use the public schools. Not everyone, but there were people who wanted to use the public schools to strip Catholic immigrants, children of their religion because they saw it as incompatible with Americans. Well, that's got to be told, too. But I but I think what we all want is a fair, objective telling of the story, right. and we do want to lay before our young people the vision of America that our founders had that, and that they embodied in the Declaration I, of Independence. And we don't want people to think of that as just a, an artifact of the past. I think we're moving from what it means to be an American into politics here. Uh, I mean, w we can agree, I believe, that we are united by principles instead of race. We can agree, I believe, that there are a few principles upon uh, rule of law, equal opportunity. We could make that list right here in three or four minutes probably. We could agree there are a few other characteristics of Americans. Um, anything is possible. After that, it's up to the politicians and the philosophers and the professors and the debates to apply those principles and come up with competing versions. I mean, the best of them, I mean, Lincoln, Lincoln stated the purpose at the time built upon those principles. Uh, Juan and Robert might have two different visions of America's future, or Robert and I might, uh, 
built upon the same principle. So what th th that's that's I mean our politics is mostly about conflicts among people based upon the same principles and or dealing with the disappointment in not realizing aspirations all men are created equal that we all agree with. Paul and then um we're, we're going to move uh, very soon to open it up for some questions. TR's historical uh, context was interesting because in 1894, uh, he, he was one generation removed from this uh, the Civil War experience. And um, what he was looking back at was this, um, this period, this long period of uh, European hegemony and, um, uh, and very advanced civilization compared to the United States. But, and you can't say that he saw in any direct or um, more precise way the um, two uh, uh, incredible episodes of mass murder about to def uh, um, not only descend upon Europe, uh, uh, self-imposed of course, um, uh, but to completely reshuffle the global deck um, and tilt it uh, in favor of, uh, of America. But one thinks, and you can't take this speech, uh, I haven't read much else of TR's, um, uh, TR's views on these matters. But there are hints here that what he did uh, uh, feel, uh, he was strongly um, saying, let's not, be, let's not be like Europe, let's not be like Europeans uh, in a lot of different ways and a lot of different vituperative language. Um, and um, one can only guess whether, and I believe it was, that he felt that part of it was not just our geographic isolation which, uh, and, the, and the oceans which protected and would protect America and tilt the landscape, but that there was something about America and American principles um, and something about Europe and European principles. And I, therefore, I'm very sympathetic with Robbie's view that, um, that what we have today is actually not that much different in terms, and actually a very, a very powerful set of choices that we have to, to continue the drift towards, uh, um, uh, towards, um, uh, multi uh, towards uh, internationalism, uh, deference to foreign law, being more like Europe. And that's more than um, uh, whether it's socialized this or socialized that. It's, it, one feels that it's part of the principles of, uh, uh, perhaps dividing America and Europe, self-reliance versus um, the collective, rule by elites uh, versus, uh, and decisions, more by elites than by the common man versus the opposite. Two final comments, Frank, Hannah, and then Harvey, and then I think we're going to th throw it all I'll, I'll make my brief. Uh, to, the, to the question of why it matters, yeah. um, you know, part of the preamble is to form a more perfect union. I think it's worth uh, realizing that one of our most fundamental human needs is communion with one another. When we have common union with a friend, with a spouse, with a neighbor, or with anyone, I have common union with the people in this room because my guess is 98% are probably American citizens. And that, that common union that more perfect union that the Constitution speaks of makes my life better. And so, uh, you know, I, I, it, the, the fact that politics enters into it, you know, in the Aristotelian sense, politics is how we order ourselves. Um, uh, and I don't think it's a, it's a dirty thing or something to avoid, it is how we order ourselves. But these issues, why they matter is, it goes to the most fundamental need we have as human beings, and that is this union with one another. And when we have it, it's something that's almost transcendent, because it's not material, but it's something we share in our hearts. Uh, and it, it can be a very profound thing, and I think what we all maybe sense is maybe some of that has been lost and we miss it. Um, I, I uh, hesitate to open my mouth here. I'm so delighted to hear the word Aristotle pronounced. <laughs> But um, I, I, I think our uh, national purpose should be uh, to be proud salesmen of, of democracy and of uh, a republic. We're good at being salesmen, we Americans. And, and, but, uh, but to be a salesman uh, isn't by itself a proud occupation. You're trying to sort of suck up to your customer a little bit. So that we shouldn't do. But we should uh, be proud of what we've done. What we've done is to be the first to make a republic that works. Let's open this to the audience. 
you have any questions. There are microphones down here. And uh, please state your name and um, let us request that we have questions, comments if they're very brief, no long speeches, please, because there are other people who also want to get to the floor, yeah. get to the microphone. Roger Scruton. Yeah, I, I'm Roger Scruton, the last surviving patriotic Englishman. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I wanted to say something to uh, Frank Hanna's original point that about patriotism of the village, because I think this is something which has been slightly overlooked, that um, maybe the kind of patriotism that Roosevelt is talking about is actually compatible with the patriotism of the village. I've been the last six years living in rural Virginia as a kind of visiting anthropologist, and um, my main observation was that this was a society which is totally constituted by volunteers. You know, we had a little village of 400 people, six <coughs> churches, 40 little societies, volunteer rescue squad. Everything was done by people's initiative at the local level, and, and this to me w is what American patriotism actually consists in. It's not incompatible with that, uh, th with the noble ideals that Robbie referred to. In fact, it, this is the thing that seemed to me, at least, to renew those ideals. And it's what we've lost in Europe. We don't actually have that society of, of volunteers anymore. And um, I think it's, uh, I don't know, maybe the pa panel would want to talk to this. The extent to which American patriotism can exist without renewing things at the local level and uh, getting to know your neighbors and doing things without interference from government. But that is why I would, I would say that this definition of Americanism is also a political issue. It is an argument between left and right because it's only if you have a government of enumerated powers, a government that limits itself, a government that does not pronounce itself sovereign over every action of the citizen. A government, if I could be a little bit parochial, that doesn't impose a requirement on getting uh, on, on an individual entering into a contract with an insurance company on, on pain of, of incurring a fine. It's only if you actually have the, the architecture of the Constitution that you allow the space for the voluntary associations which you're talking about and which uh, Tocqueville talked about uh, so famously. And that's why I think it is. Um, when Robbie raised the issue, do we want to be more the social democracy as you see in Europe, or do we want to be more the exceptional, unusual, individualistic democracy that we have traditionally been? It is getting to the essence of Americanism. And that is about American exceptionalism. We're different in that way because of our history because we're a younger country, and because we had this miraculous emergence of a class of geniuses uh, on a fringe of the developed world in the late 18th century, who gave us a gift. And that, I think, is, I mean, that, that, re that reaches almost a sacred level. It's empirically demonstrated as the most successful document probably in human history about organizing society. And to jeopardize its underlying principles and w w would mean we'd be giving up something that makes us exceptional and unique, exactly as demonstrated in your example of the society that operates uh, the, with the, the, the voluntary association. It's not something that emerges out of Virginia. It, it survives because the government knows and is required to step back. Question in the back. No, here. I'm surprised that uh, one of the founding sort of creeds that we haven't talked about much is the idea of religious liberty and church-state relations, which uh, was referred to a little bit in Roosevelt's uh, uh, the piece that you read. And so I think that, that people recognize that that's a element of Americanism, very core element, and yet we have very strong disagreements in our political life today about how to apply those principles. I'd be interested in hearing that discussed a little bit. Anyone on this subject? Bill? Um, <clears throat> I'm glad you brought that up. I think that's 
an important point. I was reminded when Robbie was talking a minute ago that the term Americanism was very current in the 1890s in another context, and that is as a, a heresy, <laughs> or a perceived heresy of uh, Pope uh, Leo XIII, uh, who we mainly know through his social teaching. But, uh, uh, and it, it I, w I don't know for certain, but it would not surprise me at all if Roosevelt was in part uh, addressing himself to precisely that language of, uh, that is, Americanism was a heresy in, in uh, treating the separation of church and state as absolute. Um, and uh, there was a lot of nervousness about this in the Vatican. And uh, uh, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me at all if Roosevelt was addressing that, although he also says that there, there's no place for no nothingism in the speech. So there's, there's a little bit of both, but he, he could not be more clear in declaring himself for the separation, the, the rigorous separation of church and state, which in those days often was, uh, had an anti-Catholic undercurrent to it. So um, it's an interesting tension there in Roosevelt himself, but that certainly, uh, I, I would see religious freedom as, as part of the liberty that uh, is, is uh, enshrined in the Declaration itself. Um, would you say, uh, however, um, that, uh, never mind Roosevelt, would you say that um, Americanism or its better equivalent today is or should be neutral uh, to the distinction between religion and atheism? Does, does it matter? Between religion and atheism? atheism. I, 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 don't oh. think, I don't think it can be entirely because uh, the nature of the rights that are viewed as inviolable are grounded in something transcendent, uh, God or nature's God, whatever that means. So I, I think that the notion that, that these rights can be grounded in somewhere where human beings can't get at them and can't meddle with them and can't undermine them is, is fundamental. Please. Yeah. I'm Roger Clegg with the uh, Center for Equal Opportunity and um, I wanted to suggest that there is some overlap between what Americanism is and what characteristics Americans must have for our country to work. Uh, and fortunately for you all, uh, in a, a column for National Review Online, I, I listed what I thought those 10 characteristics were and I was hoping you all could, could comment on them. Uh, just briefly, uh, don't disparage anyone else's race or ethnicity. Respect women. Learn to speak English. Be polite or civil. Don't break the law. Don't have children out of wedlock. Don't demand anything because of your race or ethnicity. Don't view working and studying hard as acting white. Don't hold historical grudges. And be proud of being an American. The Ten Commandments? <laughs> You know, probably uh, everyone in the room could think back uh, to their own immigrant grandparents or great grandparents, and maybe a few who would have to go back a generation or two beyond that to think of them. But think about your great grandparents or your grandparents who were parents. who were uh, immigrants. Of course, the African American case is a different different case because of slavery. But think back, those of you who are not African American, to your grandparents. And I think of my own. The thing that really strikes me, I remember so vividly about them. They're all gone now. All four are gone. But uh, is their gratitude to this country. I mean, that was in a certain sense the key to their Americanism, is the gratitude they felt. Gratitude for what? For opportunity and liberty. Opportunity and liberty. Uh, one set had come from southern Italy and basically uh, for economic opportunity, not for <coughs> political, polit political reasons. The other set from the old Ottoman Empire, definitely for political uh, 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 liberty. But they had in common, although they never learned to speak English very well, uh, that they wanted their kids to be Americans, and in part because of their gratitude to this country. And, and, and I'll tell you what they didn't have, absolutely didn't have, something that would be poisonous to gratitude, and that is an, an attitude of entitlement. I think if we, if we communicate to immigrants or anyone uh, that the proper posture to take toward the country is a, po is a, is a posture of entitlement, that I'm to be taken, taken care of. I think that just undermines the, 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 the gratitude that's part of the key to Americans, especially immigrant Americans, becoming 
becoming true Americans. Now, one, that doesn't mean that, uh, that we don't need a, a, a safety net. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't have a proper debate about where the state should step in and where private initiative or voluntary initiative should be stepping in for helping people in need. The poor will be with us always, as Jesus says, and they've got to be taken care of. That can't, we, I, I'm not proposing here the libertarian utopia by any, by any means. But I do think that <clears throat> that doesn't mean we should just drop into an attitude of entitlement because I think that does kill gratitude. But if I could just add one word to that. If you yes. combine economic liberty and political liberty, which is, I think, a fine way to summarize the, the source of the gratitude, which, in fact, I saw in my parents, who are, I'm a, a second-generation American, not a third, um, you put them together, and they constitute what we call the American dream. There is no other country, I think, on Earth for which the word dream follows the name of the country. It's only identified, I've never heard of a French a dream. Well, <laughs> I don't think I should have gone there. Too. You know, a, a Russian dream, a, a Russian dream, I suppose, is yet another Belgium this year. Uh, American dream, everybody understands it, and it is opportunity and liberty, uh, political liberty. And that's why, as you said, Juan, why did everybody come here? It's precisely for that reason. And again, it's unique to us. Democracy is unique uh, in America, but that is, and that's what I think is the, the essence of what you're calling Americanism and what we call American exceptionalism. I really think an appreciation of the value of our ideals and of our institutions comes out of that gratitude. Even if people didn't come because they think we've got great institutions or great political ideals, the experience of what they have, the opportunity given to them and to their children, I think inspires this devotion to American liberties and, and enables, enables people, even immigrant people, to be proud when their children fight for the United States in the military, as so many immigrant children do. And their, their parents are proud. They understand that their children are there abroad in harm's way <coughs> fighting for their country. They have, it really is their country, even though they're immigrants, it's their country that their children are fighting for. Mr. Yes, and, uh, my question uh, goes to Roger Scruton's comment about civ Roger Scruton's comment about civic institutions. Uh, it's been argued that capitalism and democracy are but empty vessels into which we pour our values as a nation, uh, and that these values are best preserved in civic institutions. Uh, and so the question that I had, not in the content of our, our, of our economy, the strength of our economy, or the strength of our military, but in the con content of our civic institutions. The question I, why do we hear such little conversation about those civic institutions <coughs> that the founders believe is the only place that we could preserve uh, our values? Well, I would say I, th I, I think you don't hear in Washington because, uh, you, but you do in communities. I mean, I, I haven't gotten into this very much, but on Roosevelt's first point, I, I really think it's an essence of our country that we work community by community. And as the as the speaker out here, as the anthropologist from Great Britain said, that uh, <laughs> in our communities the conversation is incessant about civic institutions, about the uh, churches and clubs and fire departments and organizations and that's really a very distingu distinguishing aspect of what we do and I, what we can do from here to, to, uh, to create environment in which that can succeed is limited government. This is also related to the American principle um, of dispersion of power versus the European principle of concentration of power and it's not just um, uh, the states versus the federal government. It's a private uh, power, phil private philanthropic power, as well as civic institutions in the community. If I could add one point. Senator Alexander, you, you talked earlier, you were trying to steer us away from a debate from le about left and right as uh, important or at least essential to a definition of Americanism. But you are emphasizing, and you did earlier, the importance of uh, the civic local institutions, the voluntary organizations. But w isn't it legitimate to say that as the state expands in its power 
as it takes over roles that, that, that traditionally it didn't have. It displaces and supplants <coughs> and marginalizes precisely these local voluntary civic institutions on which the Republic stands. And the fact that we're seeing it plays out in Europe in that way as an empirical example. It's not just a theoretical argument to one that we use empirical history to back it up. Therefore, a debate about the essence of America and, and what makes it unique, exceptional, uh, and so valuable has to include a debate over the, the size, the reach, the scope of government because of its effect on these institutions, the civic institutions, which are so fundamental, as you yourself said. No, I, 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 the yes is the answer to the question, but I, I think the way that works out in our politics, though, is that we have these principles such as liber limited government and liberty stacked up on one side, and someone might stack up equal opportunity on the other side and make an argument within an American context to say the, the government needs to add this program to create equal opportunity so these people can get to the starting line. Now, I'd be over here on the right side. Right. Someone else might be on the left side with a larger program based on equal, equal opportunity, but I think we're both Americans we're debating arguments based upon American principles. I, I would agree, but rather than questioning the Americanism of your opponent on the left, couldn't you just point out that as a historical consequence of overemphasizing equal opportunity, you would undermine the, the basic idea of limited government, in which case, if you did that, that would undermine the <coughs> entire idea of Americanism. I, I mean, precisely agree with that. And I think that's the correct way to have a political debate, not to, not to question. Right. I mean, I was actually trying to acknowledge uh, the I, Americanism I of his argument, so but to say I thought he was wrong, because, right. because my emphasis would be on the other two other principles. It's not a question of motive, it's a question of consequence, I understand. Is there one last question? Please. Uh, Hill Fratkin of the Hudson Institute. Um, at the very beginning, I, if I recall correctly, uh, Amy described um, the ambit of Americanism as being philosophy and poetry. And it, it, it has seemed to me that, um, and remarkably enough, we get the philosophy in common, but we don't, we're not sure about the poetry. And uh, it occurs to me further that the phenomenon that you're talking about with hyphenated names is a sign of that, that people see the poetry of their lives in those ethnic or religious attachments. So I'm wondering um, where that poetry would come from. And it seemed to me that uh, t at least two or three things were laid out by the panel. Uh, it would come from essentially something that would have to be, if it wasn't, if it was essentially our poetry, have to be something that unites all of us as Americans. And uh, Harvey suggested um, somehow selling ourselves uh, to others. That could be a common purpose. Um, Juan Williams uh, suggested somehow our common purpose is aspirational or, uh, to use uh, Charles's term, a dream. That is, our, what has been poetic about us has been this aspiration to do uh, to do best for ourselves, to improve ourselves, to live up to certain ideals. And sometimes, and especially with someone like Roosevelt, to uh, take that to the world. Uh, um, my question really is, um, I guess, what the panel thinks about uh, the possibilities of those, uh, that th those things as the source of poetry, but also how they would work together. I mean, um, one is inward looking, one is outward looking. Well, I think both are inevitable. I mean, I'll give you a line of political poetry that we're all familiar with, and that's the shining city on a hill, uh, as well as the American dream. Um, what is the point, again? You know, men have tried since at least the time of ancient Athens, Aristotle, to uh, come up with a workable political model for uh, organizing a nation. And I think we're agreed here that we have a pretty darn good one, and we're trying to figure out what the elements of it are. Uh, 
<coughs> the world, you know, the Congress of Vienna, uh, war. The world has a terrible tendency. The world, the world of nations, have a terrible tendency to uh, try to implode from time to time and disintegrate. Uh, when that happens, uh, it's a very difficult and horrifying situation. <coughs> and it is in America's interest, I think, not to have nations elsewhere disintegrating and imploding, as indeed they are in many parts of the world now. Uh, and so we have an outward moving interest in maintaining the American model for those <coughs> who would like to uh, imitate it. And I think Harvey's right that we should make an effort to sell it. That doesn't mean lock, stock, and barrel. It means <laughs> in terms of the kinds of <coughs> ideas and principles that are being discussed here. They work. It would not be a bad thing if other nations struggling to organize themselves adopted some of the ideas and principles that worked. And there is, poetry has its place in, in doing that, I think. Diana? Uh, yeah, I, I would just add maybe one more source for that poetry, uh, and that's Lincoln um, and everything Lincoln uh, said and, and wrote, that in Lincoln what we really get is that philosophy made poetic. Uh, and it seems to me it combines both of the two elements that Hillel mentioned, the aspirational element, the new birth of freedom, and once you secure that new birth of freedom, uh, then we really do stand forth as an example to the world. And so that our task today, it seems to me, is to, uh, is to get back to that, to Lincoln's task of the perpetuation of our political institutions, and to figure out in what ways we've departed from those institutions and how they might be revivified and restored. Last word to Bill McClain. Well, uh, first of all, I'll say Aristotle, just to be in good uh, instead <laughs> of <laughs> Professor Mansfield. Uh, I think one element of uh, the poetry of national purpose, I'm a little suspicious of the notion of national purpose, but that's another discussion. Um, but one element ought to be the concept that Dan Hanger brought up, and that is the notion of frontier. This is one element of Roosevelt that I think is enduring and timeless. I'd be very critical of him in many ways, but he, he was a friend of Turner's uh, and uh, was very influenced. There was mutual influence between the two men, so it's not at all coincidence that you should mention them. But it, it, let me put it this way. In, in it's, it's, it's very interesting that in Europe, the word frontier or its equivalence is a negative term. In America, it's a positive term. And I think that's a kind of exceptionalism that's very hard to translate into c abstract concepts, but it has something to do with opportunity. It has something to do with the ability of the individual person to realize his or her uh, possibilities, creativity, potential, irrespective of the conditions of their birth uh, and other incidentals. Uh, maybe if you have to put it in a phrase, it would be equality of opportunity rather than equality of result. But at any rate, I think that notion of the frontier and its analogs, uh, it's not for nothing that, uh, that, that politicians repeatedly have tried to revive the notion of the frontier, most notably John F. Kennedy, um, and the notion of the space program as a kind of frontiering. Uh, uh, th this is, I think, part of, our, part of our national makeup that is, I think, uh, something that relates to principles but is not reducible to them. It's a kind of story a kind of mythos. In closing, let me say, <clears throat> first of all, poetry is found in some of the stories and songs that we've included in this volume. But um, more important, I want to thank the panelists. I want to thank the Bradley Foundation. And I want to thank you all for coming. And the point you brought about economic I thought was very important. When you talked about economic and, and political for our it was that combination of here. Political places. Or economic in some, but this is the only place you can find. Was it